Today on Lawyers with Game, we speak to Jeffrey Levine from Drexel University about what collegiate esports means, having a varsity program, Title IX implications, and a host of other issues you'll want to keep track of if you're thinking about this on your campus. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lawyers with Game. If you're interested in learning more about legal issues in the worlds of esports and video games, you're in the right place. My name is Darius Gambino, and I am first and foremost a lifelong gamer. I've played on every home console system from the original Atari to the Sega Dreamcast to now the PlayStation 5. I'm also an intellectual property attorney with over 25 years of experience advising clients on issues related to patents, trademarks, and copyrights. I'm with the firm of Saul Ewing in Philadelphia, and you can find me on Twitter as at Philly IP. If you want to find me for a game, I'm Eagles Fan 71 on the PlayStation Network. Today with me is my colleague, Amy Pacola. Amy and I are both members of the video gaming and esports group at Saul Ewing. Amy has advised tons of clients in the higher education space, and so I would just ask her to say a few words about herself and her practice. Thanks so much, Daria. So long before I was a lawyer, I was a PC-based city building and life sim game fan. Yes, I had every version of the Sim series, including Sim Ant. So if anybody out there is interested in talking about simulated life, I'm your gal. Um, in real life today, I'm a member of Saul Ewing's higher education practice, and I work with schools to integrate esports into both their curricular and extracurricular programming. Thanks, Amy. And with us today is our special guest, Jeffrey Levine. He is an assistant clinical professor at Drexel University, and he's in charge of Drexel's eSports business degree program. Jeff, welcome to the program. Great to have you. Uh, thank you very much, Darius and Amy. I am absolutely thrilled to be here. We are thrilled to have you. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe. If you want to learn more information about our firm, you can visit us at www.sol.com. And please keep in mind that this series is intended to be a general and high-level discussion of legal issues in the video gaming and esports spaces. It is not intended as actual legal advice. If you need actual legal advice, you can reach out to myself or Amy, and we will be happy to help you. So today we are going to be talking about college esports programs, and particularly the impact of Title IX on those programs for equal opportunity for both men and women. So Amy, I first wanted to open it up to you. You are the expert in this area. Please give us a, a, an outline of, of some things that colleges and universities should be thinking about when they're setting up an esports program or endorsing a club-based esports program. Absolutely. So giving you the laundry list of some of the things that we're thinking about at the outset or once your, your teams are set up, um, it, it actually begins with where will esports sit in your campus ecosystem? Are we talking about club or varsity teams? Um, will student affairs or athletics or some uh, iteration of either of those campus units be responsible for overseeing um, esports on campus? Um, what are the implications of those decisions if you decide to house your esports teams under the athletics umbrella versus a student affairs umbrella? As Darius uh, teed up Title IX, we're always thinking about Title IX, and I think we'll have some great conversation today about what that means and the different ways we should be considering Title IX. But it's not only Title IX, right? We're thinking about other conduct issues. Do we need particular codes of conduct for our esports teams? Will they otherwise sort of funnel up through um, general student codes of conduct, or will we uh, adopt our athletics codes of conduct? Um, near and dear to your heart, Darius, there are IP issues um, that stem right down on through our students, um, thinking about the use of our institution's name and marks to licensing questions, ownership questions around game footage, um, recruiting and admissions. So really the laundry list of higher education issues, it applies in the, the context of esports. And so I love having these types of conversations to really think about 
um, all of these tentacles and the way uh, the way our, our higher ed brains are wired to um, to think about these things. Th thanks, Amy. I mean, I know you have a lot of questions for Jeff, um, so I'm going to let you kick it off. Uh, so um, go ahead, go for it. Fantastic. Well, Jeff, you're living some of these issues that are really exciting for me to think about in real time. But before we even get there, I, I would love to hear a little bit about your personal connections to gaming, um, to esports, and, and where it all started for you. Yeah, absolutely, Amy. Um, I will say that I grew up much like Darius with video games in my house. Uh, we had every console uh, that was really out there as the new versions came out, from the Ataris to the Dreamcasts to the Xboxes to the Playstations and everything in between. And we even went so far as having uh, arcade games in our uh, family uh, basement. Uh, I can tell you I can... One of the few people that has uh, mastered uh, Dragon's Lair as well as Elevator Action and Dig Dug, among <laughs> others. But still working on Donkey Kong. Uh, would never really could get that one. But needless to say, uh, between what was in our house and what was at the video arcades um, growing up, since I was a, a child of the, the late 80s and the 90s and the heyday of these video arcades, um, I would hate to find out if I aggregated the time at arcades and uh, playing video games at home, how much of my youth was actually spent uh, playing video games in various ways. And so um, certainly grew up uh, with video games, very, um, uh, very fluent in, in the different uh, popular titles, different systems. And um, sort of side by side, I had a passion for video games growing up, but then I also played sports, uh, traditional sports. And so play both of those side by side. Uh, there wasn't really much time between uh, for anything else between the two. And at university, I, I decided to study uh, sport management, go a traditional route, because I didn't think or I did not foresee that there would be um, career opportunities or structures to have gaming and esports be something where livelihoods could be made. Um, and so I sort of let that go. Uh, and Really, my interest and passion for video games uh, stayed out of sight, especially as I became a practicing attorney um, and then uh, began teaching uh, sport management and uh, as an adjunct and writing. And it wasn't until my doctoral program at the University of Louisville that esports and gaming came back into the forefront. Um, I had a, a colleague who told me about League of Legends and showed me what was going on and tried to play a little bit, could could not really play very well. Um, I was not able to grind, uh, but I understood having a legal background and legal eye and certainly understood right away the importance that intellectual property plays and unique governance structures and, and other issues that exist that are somewhat unique to gaming that we'll unpack later, I'm sure, but that this is a very legal heavy area. And so did a little bit of research on legal issues in esports, presented a little bit on that. And then at uh, when I came to interview here at Drexel, uh, the hiring committee asked me what I knew, knew about esports. And so I was able to speak somewhat knowledgeably, having a bit of a, a, a base and background in, in competitive video games and some of the scholarly issues. And then about a year later, after I'd been a faculty member, um, things were, were picking up and uh, Drexel was trying to understand where esports and gaming fit from a university wide perspective. So I was placed on the committee uh, from other with, with other representatives for other parts of the university at the president's request, a special sort of campus wide committee to create a, a um, vision for esports at Drexel. And part of that vision that the committee talked about uh, was an academic program along with a facility as as well as a competitive team. Mm -hmm. The first element that was created and implemented was that esports business academic program. Uh, and I had was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to lead it. Uh, it went live in fall 2020 as the pandemic was really in full street, full steam. But been working organically, trying to fit the pieces together, the academic components, the experiential learning components, uh, the uh, industry partnership components. And uh, we're, we're doing some really exciting things as we've come out of the pandemic. And as I'm sure you know, Philadelphia is a really a burgeoning area for esport business uh, in terms of where we reside in, in the Northeast and Northeast Corridor. So I've really, uh, you know, as, as a person who's played, as a person who's had a 
academic uh, and legal uh, training and more of a critical lens. I, I've really approached video games and esports from a, a variety of perspectives uh, that's helped me have this unique uh, viewpoint. Your mention of uh, Dragon's Lair, of course, brings me back. I remember walking into the arcade for the first time when that game was was put there and there was all these people crowded around it. No one had ever seen anything like that with, you know, anim, anim, animated cut scenes and, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, you know, and, and actually like your parents, uh, my parents told me that video games were never going to get me anywhere. Uh, but they didn't know that Drexel and a lot of other schools were going to at some point have esports uh, undergraduate degree programs um, for people to pursue careers, not just uh, as professional gamers, but um, in marketing fields, in um, finance fields. So um, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the undergraduate de- degree program, which you were responsible for setting up, and what some things that if I was going to college today and, and I was pursuing that program, you know, what are some of the intended career fields um, for your students? You're you're right in the sense that esports as, as an industry is a modern sort of academic program uh, that students are preparing for careers in, and it speaks to the the really exciting opportunities that exist. And because of that, esports is part of the video game industry. So in order to uh, prepare students, we at Drexel have created this curriculum that collaborates with one of our in, uh, one of our other uh, academic units, which is the Westfall College for Media Arts and Design. And we want to provide a holistic educational curricular experience for these students where they get, yes, the nuts and bolts of what is game design, how, how do you do programming, what goes into content creation, what what are the technical aspects, but then also because it's a business focused industry that has myriad tentacles in revenue generation, marketing, advertising, facility ops, branding, legal issues, um, the list goes off finance, the list goes on and on. Um, the foundation of the bachelors of, of business and business administration, which is the esports business BSBA, um, students uh, who are enrolling need to take the foundational courses of the Lebeau College of Business. So you'll get your accounting, you'll get your finance, you'll get your core business courses before even going to the um, the electives that are part of the BSBA for esports. So once you get to that that, that point, even if you don't work in the esports industry or gaming industry, you'll have a really solid foundation to succeed in in the business industry. So we, uh, Westfall oversees the classes that are focused more on uh, the technical aspects, like I mentioned. And then here at LeBeau, um, we are focusing on the the, the sort of operational aspects, the marketing, the legal, uh, the branding, because a lot of esports now mirrors traditional sports in terms of how it operates. And, and we can have that debate maybe offline about is that for better or for worse, but that's where we are in terms of a lot of the uh, investment, the, the capital that's coming from traditional stakeholders from, from, from business and from the sports industry try, have been exacting their will to make esports look like traditional sports in, in many ways, which has worked in some instances and, and, and has not. But if you're having an event at the Wells Fargo Center here uh, focused on video games, you're going to have facility operations, you're going to have uh, legal issues, you're going to have marketing, you're going to have ticketing, you're going to have sales, you're going to have risk management, you're going to have a variety of different aspects that are similar to traditional sports. So we, uh, our faculty here, teach courses uh, that have components from traditional sports as well as uh, esports and gaming, and, and I'm teaching the majority of the courses here, starting with the business of esports class. Uh, teaching, I, I'm teaching a legal issues in esports class. Uh, so uh, you know, it, 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 I, you folks have the expertise as well. So I, and, and part of what I want to do with these programs, with this program, is have um, an industry component, whether it's guest speakers, whether it's experiential learning opportunities by partnering 
with industry here in Philly or across the country. Um, that is a, a way to not only provide that real life component, because uh, that is going to be critical. You just don't need theory, you need the practical aspects, but also get students opportunities to get uh, co-ops, get internships, get uh, entry level opportunities to jumpstart their careers. So we're really trying to do something that's holistic, but also ex heavy on experiential learning since um, these industries, uh, this industry, uh, they, there's positions open and they're looking for people right now. So we need to get them skilled up as quickly as possible. Yeah, Nerd Street Gamers is a huge uh, a company within Philly with a huge facility. Um, that I think as it grows is going to need uh, some of your students. So uh, the jobs are out there. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. And so sort of shifting outside of the classroom, um, one of the things, Jeffrey, that I was really interested to talk to you about is sort of the confluence of this business-focused curriculum with your background as a lawyer and this is, you know, we, we mentioned IP being near and dear to, to Darius's heart. Um, Title IX, for better or worse, is really in, in my legal sweet spot, um, and it's where I spend a lot of my time. And I understand that um, you've been preparing to and are working on a study of Title IX issues in collegiate esports, and would love to hear a little bit about that, um, where you are in the process and sort of what you're hoping hoping to be able to teach the rest of us of, uh, around the confluence of, of these issues. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about this uh, piece of research. So as we all know, collegiate esports is really an emergent area. And I've had the pleasure of working with several colleagues in sport management on an exploratory project that will hopefully unearth some of these emerging trends within collegiate esports. And attached to those emerging trends, really looking at uh, the Title IX issues that um, are unique to competitive video games and esports. And so to that end, we've spent a good amount of time preparing surveys, several surveys. And one of the surveys is going to be for esports administrators and coaches, because at this point, administrators and coaches often wear similar hats or one person fills both roles. And that is going to be investigating specific phenomena in esports at the college level. And the other survey is going to be is drafted to be targeting Title IX uh, office professionals. And each of these surveys are going to be disseminated, hopefully, to at least a, a hundred uh, members of that target demographic, and then that's the first stage of data collection. Because up until now, we've been trying to get a sense uh, of this in this, uh, of this uh, landscape by looking at, at existing lit, which there's not a great amount of lit that uh, that has collected data, and then trying to understand what questions or what what would be the best way to, to, to unearth um, these findings. And so that's where we've been spending a lot of our time with survey development. So after we've gotten enough responses, we'll move on to the next phase, which is actually doing uh, interviews with eight to 12 professionals from each group to get a little bit more in depth to understand th the issues that exist in esports with the uh, with the ops people slash coaches as well as what's in the title nine offices and so um really the title nine survey is trying to understand their perceptions and what's the general understanding that they have for esports and any issues that might have previously emerged while they've been working in the title nine office because at this point, I'm not, it's unclear what level of understanding or experience Title IX professionals have with, with esports. And, and we'll talk about sort of, you know, the unique, again, the unique issues from a Title IX perspective that esports has. And I, and I know that, Amy, you're quite knowledgeable about this, having listened to your thoughts uh, previously. Um, and, and those thoughts were right on the money, by the way. Um, and <laughs> of course, of course. And the administrator survey is 
going a bit of a different direction, but it's looking at the most common responsibilities of these people in these positions, but also what are the predominant approaches for player recruitment, team makeup, as well as practices that may or may not exist to help combat or mitigate um, uh, sexual harassment as well as sexual violence. And that really gets to the heart of one of the prongs of Title IX. Um, so from a practical standpoint, we, we've got done piloting these these uh, surveys, and we're in the process where we're going to be submitting to, to actually get uh, you know submitting our, our our paperwork so that we can actually perform this perform a phase one of this uh, of this uh, project by collecting data. But just from our piloting, uh, there's been some interesting practical insights. One, it's that esports, like I said, might not be on the radar for many Total Nine folks. Uh, for, for various reasons. And the second thing is that managers and coaches might not be aware of the implications embodied specifically, the specific implications of Title IX, legal challenges, legal concerns. So th those are from a practical standpoint. Now, from a theoretical standpoint, what was really, really interesting for me is we interviewed uh, people, experts from a variety of areas stakeholders in and around college esports. You had uh, several attorneys that are, are, are uh, knowledgeable about Title IX in, in, in the college landscape, several people who are working as administrators and coaches in college esports, and then academics who are just um, experts about the literature and sort of the underlying issues that exist in gaming and within esports since game since esports takes a lot of its norms uh, from esports. And so these three themes that have come out are that the pathways for amateur or high school esports development and the pipeways to get them to recruit, be recruited into college uh, esports programs have not really formalized yet. These structures um, really exist only in the, there's a tendency that um, programs might look to ranking systems or these open events to, to find the, the best players. And because ranking up is really a function of time spent, um, and some of the literature says that uh, female gamers start a little bit later in this super competitive field, that there's a greater prevalence of male players, even those, though those might not be the best amateur players, but because um, maybe some of these program programs are looking for the path of least resistance to recruit people, to recruit talent. Um, that might be one of the outcomes that males are showing up more. And um, as, as we know, um, video games are, are popular, you know, and fairly, I wouldn't say 50, 50, but fairly close between the genders. So there's certainly interest in there's and there's uh, talent skill level, but the, the male players tend to suck up the oxygen. In terms of the structures of gaming and esports, generally speaking, these hegemonic structures, sort of the the, the nature of, of how video games are, are dominated by toxicity, misogyny, to, you know, that drives away potential female players from advancing up to these higher levels, which operates to, to stunt the number of potential um, female players in the college level, even though interest might exist. And it's one person made this really good point. You've got these two sort of areas, uh, traditional sort of sports and traditional esports. They both sort of are very male heavy, male um, masculinity heavy. And then they emerge in East, you know, the gaming, sorry, the gaming uh, culture in, in sport culture. And they emerge uh, in esports. They have sort of a double whammy that might, might have a pro problematic outcomes. And then the, the final theme from a Title IX perspective, talking to some people who are uh, knowledgeable about, about this space is due to the changing uh, nature of, of these Title IX regulations and how they might develop or change from administration to administration. It's like a cat and mouse game for them to catch up. And then these Title IX offices, they don't really have the resources or budget or, or ability to really focus on one of the prongs, which of course is expanding opportunities. 
and instead are really focused more on the uh, the adjudicating, investigating, adjudicating issues that come up in terms of harassment and and sexual violence, and and, and so they're not, you know, as one person said, they're not even able to touch on that the core prong of expanding access and opportunity if the interest exists, and they're more stuck in the other side. So um, th those were really interesting themes that came out just from the, the, the piloting. And I'm expecting um, the surveys is, is going to unearth, it's going to help reveal even more interesting uh, themes based on the, the number of people that uh, we are able to reach and the data that we can, we can find. So that, that's, uh, hopefully that's not like drinking from the fire hose uh, since, uh, you know, went maybe a little bit uh, deeper than the, the 10 cent introduction there. No, it's incredibly helpful. And I am, I'm not surprised that, you know, in sort of piloting already, you are identifying that there's um, opportunity, continued access to participation, um, and the sort of reaction to a culture that may not always be inclusive for one reason or another. Um, and the reaction to a complaint tends to get the most attention and bandwidth because we have legal obligations in that front that sort of live in fresh in, in minds, as you say, because of changing regulatory landscape. I'm not surprised to hear, but I am heartened to hear uh, that you will sort of escalate or elevate the, the focus on that sort of that front end opportunity and aspect angle, um, which we can sort of lose sometimes when we have no choice but to respond to capital H harassment and um, not to diminish the importance of that, but certainly it's, uh, it's a question of resources and, and bandwidth here. So I'm really excited to see the outcome of um, your research and, and sort of dig in a little bit um, but that's actually a really nice segue, I think, to the state of state of play at Drexel. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, the curricular side of things, but you mentioned that you've helped launch club sport or club esports at at Drexel, and so I'm really curious to hear what that looks like um, and how you and may end up benefiting from your own research and sort of how you're thinking about about these structures. Yeah, I've been really fortunate uh, to be asked to be involved in conversations at Drexel about where are we going in terms of the vision for, for esports and in gaming from a, a comprehensive perspective. Um, I can tell you right now at Drexel, in addition to the esports business program, we have, as I alluded to, colleagues and partners at the Westfall College of Media, Arts and Design. We've got uh, the, the gaming degree. We've got an eSport minor where we partner with them as well. We have at Westfall uh, the Entrepreneurial Game Studio uh, that helps. It's sort of like an incubator where uh, students, uh, if they're admitted, are able to take an idea from inception all the way up to marketing and sort of rolling out, um, which is really exciting for in terms of a game that they want to turn into an eSport or turn into a very popular franchise. Uh, there's also also the Excite Center, which is this really a wonderful program that helps uh, various types of media and technology for, for, for interdisciplinary reasons. So we've got, in addition to uh, our uh, eSport business major here, we've got other academic offerings. And then, as you mentioned, Amy, from the competitive standpoint, we launched uh, uh, our club team, uh, I think uh, maybe a year or two ago, it used to be the Drexel uh, eSport and Gaming Club, which was the largest, one of the largest student groups on campus. And due to the popularity of eSports and sort of uh, taking uh, as a blueprint the uh, report that my colleagues and I issued uh, about where eSports would go for at Drexel, it was severed, so it was now two entities. One is the uh, gaming club, which is still very popular, and the competitive club team at Drexel. And I think we uh, compete in a variety of titles, uh, at least 10 or so. Um, and several of these titles uh, compete in NACE. And in fact, um, one of our, our titles 
is back to the, the, the team is back to back national championships for Nace Star League for CSGO or uh, Counter Strike Global Offensive and beating, taking down the big schools, you know, the, the ones that are either larger institutions or uh, schools that are just better funded where they use esports and gaming as their front porch, which we, we, we really even haven't talked about. But of course, there's this tendency within higher education for smaller schools to use video games and esports in a manner similar to how some schools use football or basketball. So that has been uh, one of the driving forces for esports popularizing throughout college uh, in, in IAGs. But in, in terms of Drexel, I think we have a very vibrant uh, student uh, body in terms of those who participate in gaming in the gaming club, as well as those who are, are active in the competitive team. And um, we also, uh, and we're going to be talking about, I'm, I'm sure, uh, athletics has uh, created this uh, task force uh, where I'm, I'm working with uh, colleagues uh, throughout the university uh, to help sort of create a plan of action for a varsity esports program. Uh, so we, we really have um, just a, 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 a vibrant hub of, of esports activity here at Drexel. And then as Darius mentioned, we've got Nerd Street not that far away. Uh, we've got TAP Esports, we've got Metro Esports, we've got a variety uh, of, of other potential partners uh, that we can work with uh, to uh, have even larger uh, opportunities, both uh, on campus and off campus. Now, we, we do have to talk about legal issues. That's that's also a good transition, uh, at least for a few minutes, since this is a legal podcast. And, and I don't know if you if you want me to reveal this, um, but Jeff is uh, an attorney as well. Uh, and so he's uh, he's looking at some legal issues um, in in dealing with the esports uh, landscape at Drexel. So I know you can't talk about anything that's ongoing or privileged or anything like that. But Jeff, at like a very high level, you know, what are one or two of the kind of legal issues that that you've seen since you've been affiliated with the esports uh, degree and um, uh, comp competitive programs at Drexel? Yes. Uh, I should mention before jumping into it that I also have had the, uh, the, ben the, the pleasure of uh, ad advising the club esports team and, and working with their executive board. One of the issues that has come up, and I imagine it's not unique to Drexel, is how do institutions of higher education who for decades have been wholly uh, prohibiting compensation for players who make money off of what they're playing at the college level or making money off of being sufficiently good and famous at their at their sport, what do, how do we negotiate that in in today's day and age? So, uh, as I mentioned, we've got a very very competitive CS:GO team, and so issues about prize money have come up. How do how does that get allocated? How does that get distributed to the winning team or to the uh, to the um, the, the, the entire club team, uh, as opposed to it's a squad of players, especially where there might be rules in place at the institution level, at the conference level, at the NCAA level, or what have you, that prohibits cash payments for um, uh, for participating in the the game that they're playing, representing the institution. So. Um, this is an issue, compensation, whether it's prize money, whether it's scholarships, whether it's uh, sponsorships and endorsements. Since we're living in this age of uh, age of name, image and likeness, that's, I think, um, not only a big issue for uh, any for, for Drexel, but also just really any school out there that is trying to walk a tightrope where they want to take advantage of a very competitive esports team or this emerging opportunity that administrators might not be very familiar with, but they know by virtue of, because demographics are changing and these are where their potential students live, that they need to be responsive in, in field teams. So how do we negotiate this? Uh, as I mentioned, scholarships are part of that. 
um, other benefits, uh, whether it's monetary, non-monetary access and opportunity. Um, those are all sort of part of the, the compensation uh, or benefits uh, um, discussion. The other um, question that comes up is recruitment efforts, um, making sure that we are doing what we need to do to foster a diverse and vibrant uh, team or organization, since we talked about at the beginning, touched on very uh, briefly. And I know you've talked about this in the past that esports and gaming is popular uh, for virtually uh, everyone, whether it's a male, female, uh, or, or uh, age group, uh, demographics, a variety of demographics. So we know that there's interest. So how do we, how do we res be responsive to that, that interest, not just satisfying uh, potential Title IX uh, uh, requirements, but also just going above and beyond and, and, and being inclusive and, and being uh, a good steward of representation and diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, I think fostering health of those participating in, in esports, whether it's at the club level or a varsity level, or even just those who are playing uh, for fun, the, the, the mental health aspect, as well as the physical wellness aspect. So uh, we've been had conversations about, about that. And that's really about, in addition to legal obligations, just the governance approach. And I think an issue that exists above and beyond just sort of black and white IP or, or contracts or harassment is what, are, what structures do college esport programs need to foster or create that speak to the uniqueness of esports and video games that are not going not gonna to look like basketball or tennis or, or football? They, we need to acknowledge and understand that because competitive video games is a unique, uh, a, a unique dimension of the of college uh, competitive uh, athletics, we need to have new approaches, new governance structures, new scaffolding that will be responsive and and and, and really meet the needs of those we're seeking to serve at, at the student level, as well as fostering the the uh, objectives of the institution itself. Yeah, I all of this resonates with me. Um, and, you know, as you said, Drexel is not alone in sort of confronting and working through these dynamics. There are a lot of places and in a lot of ways that our traditional collegiate athletics models will serve esports, um, but there are also ways that it won't. And, you know, you talk about prize money um, and other benefits to our, our athletes. I think there's also a recruiting angle there when we think about um, somebody who may opt out of participation in a university ecosystem because they're able to be more successful outside of that. And, and how can we build productive, competitive teams if somebody says, well, I can, I can make money on my own, um, which is just different, right? That's just different than somebody who's unlikely to be drafted into the, the NBA um, without having that collegiate experience. But, but all of that aside, I know you're, you're actively working through, uh, as you say, sort of what structures to import, what structures need to be changed, and what structures need to be built from the ground up. And I understand that you're participating in, in Drexel's Varsity Esports Task Force. Are you dealing with some of those issues in that context? Or um, what else are you, are you looking at? And sort of what's the, to the extent you can share publicly, what's sort of the, the hope um, that you'll learn and, and benefit from as a, as a product of this task force? Yes, I can probably speak more in the general sense um, about what what we're working on in the task force but this task force reflects the interdisciplinary collaborative nature of video games and esports and also um reflects the the variety of of esports activity that's going on at at at, at, at uh, drexel so i'm part of this this group uh who has representatives not just from you know my unit, the LeBeau College of Business, but we've got athletics, we've got student life, we've got campus rec, we've got IT, we've got um, uh, Westfall, we've got uh, the, the we've got uh, 
representation from the club esports team executive board. So we're including our, the students who are really living this, um, which I think is really important. Getting getting the the input and guidance from um, those who are who are not only going to be most impacted by whatever recommendation and, and uh, approach Drexel uses for esports at the competitive level, but also um, those who are experiencing this right now and they're going to experience it in the future since they're likely to be members of the, of the varsity team. Um, so we are looking at creating uh, a vision for the varsity esports at Drexel and what sort of resources would be needed for that. Um, and we talked about, you know, I, I touched on some of the resources uh, that that could potentially be utilized, but also the governance structure, the support structures, uh, you know, coaches, administrators, uh, uh, what's, where will they practice? Where will they play their games? Um, recruitment, um, what will we be looking at in terms of collaborators, both inside of Drexel and outside of sponsors, uh, uh, content creation? It, 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 how will this entity sustain itself? And what will it mean for the university? As I mentioned before, there are numerous examples of institutions out there who use uh, esports as a way to differentiate themselves from other competitors and establish esports as their front porch. And they do it to drum up student interest. They do it to uh, to create excitement on, with the student body recruit a uh, new potential uh, uh, from new potential areas, uh, demographics, as well as uh, unite alumni. So those are all great, especially for the, the investment for esports uh, from a varsity standpoint, still far below say football or basketball, which might have the, a similar impact in terms of energizing or galvanizing these various stakeholders. But we also need to figure out um, how, uh, who we're going to work with uh, in terms of making sure this is, is a success, what unique support structures are going to exist. Um, and so we've really been trying to create this, uh, this, this vision from the financial standpoint, well, I guess from the administrative standpoint, the mission standpoint, the uh, governance standpoint, the human capital standpoint, the uh, budget, uh, who, number of teams, um, things to ensure uh, that we're, you know, we're, we're uh, meeting the legal obligations and, and going but of above and beyond that, uh, fostering opportunities for, uh, uh, for uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and just really going the whole nine yards. So we really only get one shot at this. And we're at a point where I think there's a, a, a critical mass of institutions out there that are finally adopting esports that other schools are going to look around and say, Hey, why aren't we doing this? And all of these sort of hesitations or constraints are going to finally maybe go by the wayside, but we still want to make sure that we can establish ourselves as a leader in this space, as opposed to a follower. And so, um, really hoping that when we are done with this process, it will not only speak to meeting the needs of all of our stakeholders, but also be planting a, a, a flag in the ground that will show that Drexel is a leader in esports and gaming, where we have collaborations with athletics, student life, the, the bachelors of business and esports program with Westfall, with, you know, with our local stakeholders here uh, in, in Philadelphia, and really becoming an exemplar for a, a successful college esports program. So, but that's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take commitment and vision and buy-in, which I'm not speaking specifically to Drexel, but from a general standpoint, decision makers often at, in higher education are risk averse and they're not looking, they have trouble understanding or conceptualizing things that they're unfamiliar with, which video games as, as a competitive sport might fall under that, that I'm not quite sure. We need to get in the esports, but I'm not sure why. And I, that's something I want to avoid. I want to make sure that the decision makers fully understand and support this and see the the value yeah, that esports is the present and the future. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. This has been a really uh, interesting and informative conversation. Um, 
we have uh, we're running out of time, but we have time for uh, one more question. So I wanted to get your your quick thoughts on um, kind of the future of esports at Drexel and um, at the university level. We've been seeing um, now more and more coming out of COVID with uh, the return to in person game tournaments. We're seeing a lot more of the big publishers like uh, Riot and Epic Games um, organizing college tournaments. Um, so, uh, you know, where, where, where do you see things going in the next couple of years? Starting with Drexel, I think that we will become a hotbed of esports uh, at the varsity level and, and that given where we are uh, with the potential uh, resources we have at our, at our fingertips, I, I think we'll, that we will continue our, our ascent. Uh, we recently uh, became varsity members of NACE and we're in the process of uh, be, you know, crafting our varsity uh, vision. So I, that will come to fruition. We'll, uh, we'll get access to a facility that will be, that will be one of the leaders within the college esports and will uh, help to fulfill that vision for becoming, for esports and gaming being a front porch for Drexel. Um, issues about NIL or about player, uh, college students making money off of their, their winning winning or name image uh, or their famousness those will be put to bed uh that will no longer be an issue and i think generally speaking from the college standpoint i think my bold prediction and i don't know how bold it is per se but i think the ncaa who famously walked away from esports uh years ago they'll actually do an about face and try to exert some sort of authority or control in an effort to stay relevant as the traditional college landscape continues to evolve and conferences be are, are becoming more powerful in college sports. So I think it makes sense that NCAA will try to find new relevance or power in an emerging area like esports. So I, I think that we'll see that come to fruition. And we'll also see colleges and institutions become more nimble and, and have a better understanding of esports and codes of conduct and new structures will become more commonplace specific to esports and we'll we'll see a learning curve but we'll see these new stru these structures help to uh help to envelop traditional structures to to meet the needs that esports embodies from a, a legal and governance perspective so um hopefully uh those aren't too radical of predictions but um i i i'm curious to see what role these, you know, the publishers uh, take in, in maybe wrestling away um, the, the control from other stakeholders when it comes to the college landscape as college becomes more and more lucrative and a larger market for esports and gaming. Yeah, no, I think those are all very uh, realistic predictions, actually. And I'd say I agree with all of them. So I uh, really appreciate you coming on today, Jeff. Really appreciate your time and all your insight. Thank you so much. Oh, like I said, it was an absolute pleasure. Uh, really happy to have this conversation. So uh, if you have any questions about any of the legal issues that we raised on the podcast today, you can drop them into the comments and Amy and I will try to answer them without providing any real legal advice, of course. Until next time, I'm Darius. This is Amy. And we are Lawyers with Game. We'll see you next time.